look at crypto prices this morning down across the board. The price of Bitcoin falling over 8 percent in the last week after the Securities and Exchange Commission approved spot Bitcoin ETFs for U.S. public trading last Thursday. Bitcoin ETFs pulling in nearly $900 million in just the first three days of trading. We're even higher than that today. Joining me right now here at the World Economic Forum in Davos is the CEO of Ripple, Brad Garlinghouse. Brad, great to see you. Great to see you. Thanks Thank you so much me. for being here. I want to get your take on the impact of this ETF approval. What have you seen? Well, I think it's a very big deal, uh, in large part because I think it's further validation from institutions and even, in this case, a, a government entity, where you know, the crypto has been on kind of the outskirts, I think, and increasingly you're seeing that come into the mainstream. And so I think it's a validation. I think it's further indication of more institutions coming into the crypto asset market. And, and, and Ripple enables global financial institutions. Take, take us through that. How? So Ripple, at its core, uh, we sell blockchain technologies and solutions to enterprises. We focus primarily on financial institutions. We started with a payment solution to, to settle cross-border settlement for uh, banks, for PSPs. You know, typically, cross-border payments have been slow. They've been expensive. Using these technologies, we can dramatically reduce the cost and increase the speed and efficiency. And now you're seeing financial services institutions try to get their own strategy with regard to blockchain underway. How has that changed the dynamic for Ripple? Well, I think anytime you have a new technology, it's, it's nascent. And although crypto has kind of been around for 10 or almost 12 years, let's say, it's still new. And I think you have a lot of large organizations, even J.P. Morgan, despite Jamie Dimon's comments about how he thinks about crypto, they're investing heavily in blockchain technologies. Now, that being said, I think in order for blockchain to thrive and for the largest population to benefit from these technologies, you can't have insular closed networks. Like the whole point, it's kind of like the Internet. The Internet opened up networks. You had AOL and CompuServe and Prodigy. Along comes the Internet to create interoperability. Crypto does that and can do that across many banks and to provide dramatic improvements to how we think about money movement and really any transaction. And with any new technology, I question whether or not those writing the laws around the regulation framework really understand the technology. Now, recently, you called the Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Gary Gensler a, quote, political liability to the United States. Uh, you said he's acting in the interests of citizenry or the long-term growth of the economy, that he's not acting uh, in the, uh, on behalf of, of customers and users. Tell us more. Well, look, I think uh, Gary Gensler has prioritized hiring more lawyers to litigate the industry. And this is often described as, uh, you know, it, lit, or kind of regulation through enforcement. If we just took the time to codify rules of the road, most of the industry in crypto wants to follow the rules of the road. Countries around the world have leaned in. Even the European Union, 27 countries in the European Union have come together to create a construct for how crypto should be regulated. In the United States, we haven't done this work. I, I jokingly suggested maybe what we should just do is type into chat GBT, how should the U.S. <laughs> yeah. That's more than the U.S. <laughs> yeah, SEC true. has done. And it, it's frustrating. And I think uh, I mean, even, I guess, yesterday, there was a, a court hearing between Coinbase and the SEC. And the, the judicial system continues to slap down the SEC because they're overreaching. They're overstepping what the laws say. It's the reason why they lost the case against Ripple. It's the reason why they lost the case against Grayscale. It's the reason why they were dragged kicking and screaming to have an ETF. Thus, you know, as I was quoted, I think uh, Gary Gensler hasn't been acting. He's been acting on almost his own agenda, not the people's agenda in why? the United States. You know, I, I wish I had a clear answer to that. I, I think these are technologies that are here to stay. And the ETF approval is, I think, further indication of that. It's just frustrating that we're spending so much time in the judicial process to get clarity when we could do that as many other countries like Japan, the UK, the UAE, Switzerland here in Switzerland. You know, these are not small economies. They're doing the work to provide that clarity. And in the U.S., I think it's become a political agenda, not a policy agenda. From someone who studied this as many years as you have, what would be the proper framework on a regulatory environment that needs to be in place? Well, I think the number one thing I think about is not about regulating the technology. It's about regulating the outcomes and the activity. Just because we have new, new technologies, we should still care about things like KYC, know your customer. We should still care about anti-money laundering, AML. Those are principles that are, are, I think, sacrosanct. I think the U.S. SEC has been trying to expand their remit to say, well, this new market, a $1.7 trillion market of crypto assets, is going to be under the remit of the SEC in the United States. The law does not support that. 
The CFTC is a much more natural regulator. And, it, you know, things mm -hmm. people will say, well, what about FTX? And, you know, ironically, Gary Gensler is meeting with Sam Bankman Fried repeatedly. You know, FTX isn't about a crypto fraud, FTX is about a fraud. It happens to have been crypto, and it definitely was a self inflicted wound for the industry. But one of the reasons I'm excited for what is ahead in 2024 is the headwinds of these self-inflicted wounds have largely abated. Are you clear on who the regulators are? Because it seems like there are still questions, SEC, CFTC, or maybe everybody. Well, in the U.S., there's still confusion, for yeah. sure. Uh, outside of the U.S., and the reason why Ripple has continued to grow very quickly outside the U.S., 95% of our customers are non-U.S. financial institutions. 75% of our hiring last year was outside the United States because of this. But yet, if you go back to the earliest days of the Internet, the U.S. did the work and provided clarity of how the Internet would be regulated. And the Internet today is, on a geopolitical basis, has benefited the United States more than any other country. It's a great point. I want to get your take on what the CEO of Circle said. He says he sees a strong chance that the U.S. passes laws for stablecoin issues this year. Brad, tell us about the stablecoin and the potential looming regulation there. So I think the, the regulation there is appropriate. I think it is the priority uh, on Capitol Hill. I've spent a bunch of time in Washington, D.C. The U.S. Treasury, I mean, stablecoins, 95-plus percent of the market of stablecoins is the U.S. dollar stablecoin. You have Tether. You have USDC. And I think the U.S. Treasury wants to see that those laws passed, and I think they will be pushing Congress to act. And I think that's, that's good. That's forward progress. Uh, there are new dynamics of what stablecoins mean to uh, financial kind of settlement. And so uh, I think you know, the uh, CEO, Jeremy Allaire of Circle, is, is correct that that'll probably happen the first half of this year. A uh, piece in the journal this morning on how China's crypto traders are evading the rules there. Um, they write this. The success of the country's crypto traders in evading the rules shows how difficult it will be for regulators across the world, including the United States, to actually police this industry. Your reaction? You know, I, I think there are elements of that with any new technology. You know, there's obviously the Great Firewall of China is something that has, you know, people have sought to circumvent, evade within China for, you know, uh, like probably a decade or two. I, I think, again, if you think about the activities that these technologies enable, KYC still matters, AML still matters. And ultimately, Today, you know, there are the off-ramps through typically exchanges like Coinbase that are very good actors, where I think you are able to enforce these kinds of regulations. That's part of the, you know, the self-inflicted wound of a settlement with Binance, the largest exchange in the world, uh, with the U.S. government, you know, I think a few months ago. Well, that settlement you just referred to, congratulations to you and to Grayscale. What does this mean for you in terms of new business opportunities now that that's behind? Look, we, Ripple really thrived under the scrutiny of the SEC, but outside the United States. My hope is that now that there is uh, at least clarity for Ripple that XRP is not a security, that that opens up the U.S. market a little bit. The challenge, of course, is you still have U.S. regulators who are pretty hostile, right? The, the SEC continues their uh, litigation, enforcement through litigation, and you know, even the OCC has been pretty negative about crypto. My view is this is a technology, this is an asset class that is here to stay. We need to embrace it and understand that. And I think ultimately the U.S. typically gets it right. It's just has taken a little while. So what's the pushback for Jamie Dimon, who was on the program last week, saying, look, look who's using crypto, you know, terrorists. Look who's using sex traffickers. You know, my reaction to that is, uh, is terrorists and sex traffickers use cash. Yeah. Uh, if you look on a percentage <laughs> basis, uh, yeah. I, I'm not trying to say that any new yeah. technology... Bad actors can use any new tool. Bad actors will use AI. Bad actors will use crypto. Bad actors. I, I think there are a lot of very good actors in crypto who are doing the right thing. Ripple only works with regulated financial institutions. You can't have anonymous transactions using Ripple's technology. So, you know, some of those things I think are good political talking points. They're not reality. Yeah, well said. Brad, great to have you this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much.